uh, uh, video. Yeah, we are now live, gentlemen, and we're just waiting for people to uh, arrive at the show. For those of you who are watching now, um, you can see where you can submit questions using the chat feature. Uh, you can join us on YouTube. You can text to the phone number, or you can email northchannelsailing at gmail.com. So three Irish guys walk into a bar with a chihuahua. <laughs> Remember, we are live. And a mute uh, uh, video. Yep. We are now live, gentlemen, and we're just waiting for people to uh, arrive at the show. For those of you who are watching now, um, you can see where you can submit questions using the chat feature. Uh, you can join us on YouTube. You can text to the phone number, or you can email northcanalstanning at gmail.com. Okay. So three Irish guys walk into a bar with a chihuahua. <laughs> Remember, we are live. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to ICW Tune-Ups and Tips featuring Claiborne Young, who you see on the left side of your screen. Hello, Claiborne. Hello. And Mark Doyle, who is center screen. Hello, Mark. Center screen. Hello, everybody. And myself, Wally Moran. The goal of this seminar, this webinar more appropriately, is to help new ICW cruisers and those who are planning on coming cruising in the near future uh, with any issues and problems that they might be having at this point. Um, Mark and Claiborne are well known for their expertise on the ICW and what we'd like you to do is if you have questions uh, and that would be questions other than uh, Captain Stan Walker's one about the Irish guys please uh, but if you have questions sent on the ICW or your own experiences you need assistance what have you let us know and we will answer those questions any questions that we're unable to answer in tonight's webinar we will respond to on the Google Plus page for this event and you'll get your answers there. Uh, I'll also at that time post other locations where they'll be available. If you want to review this webinar at the end of it, 
you'll be able to catch it on YouTube and that link will also be available. So what I'd like to do is start off, I think, uh, by asking Claiborne to give us a bit of an introduction of himself and then Mark and then I, I'll make a few comments and then we'll, uh, we'll go on. Claiborne, over to you. Oh, wow. And I guess I shouldn't take 30 minutes at this, huh, Wally? <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, fellow cruisers, my name is Claiborne Young. I have been in this rather unusual business of writing cruising guides or more lately publishing cruising information on the web for uh, about 34 years now. Uh, I think at last count I've made some 363 trips up and down the intercoastal waterway and I look forward to kind of sharing the little bit I've learned with you tonight. So Mark, over to you. <laughs> All right, my uh, wife Diane and I, we write the uh, On the Water Chart Guide series. We've got cruising guides and anchor guides, and we live aboard a PDQ uh, MV34. We've recently gotten over to the dark side, and uh, we always had sailboats before this, but now we've got uh, a, a PDQ Power Cat, and uh, we proudly only draw two feet four. We refer to four foot draft vessels now as deep draft vessels, and uh, we. Uh, We've we've been at it for a while. My first round trip to the ICW was in '87, so uh, we, we've got some experience. Not as much as Claiborne's, but I don't think anybody does. Claiborne's the king of this. Over to you, Wally. <laughs> There's no question that Claiborne certainly has has been around here for a while. I remember when I was taking my sail training down in Florida, and we actually used one of Claiborne's cruising guides, the Southwest Florida Guide. And, and Claiborne, I, I have to tell you, and I don't think I've ever teased you about this before. But um, the location we selected for a restaurant to go visit that night, it was out of business. That was one of the big problems with paper cruising guides, Wally. <laughs> I think it was actually more a problem with that particular location in Florida. There was nothing for miles in any direction. <laughs> but anyway, I've, 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 for 10 years I've missed the butter tarts we didn't have. In any event, what I'd like to do for starters is to suggest uh, to those of you who are watching, especially the new cruisers who are just heading down now, and this comment really goes directly to the guys. It's not a race to get to Florida or the Bahamas. Most of the stress that I've seen in cruisers coming south this year has been because they're rushing. They're trying to rush to beat the cold. They're trying to rush to get down to Florida. They're, they're racing and racing and racing. Uh, one couple that I talked to, the guy was really frustrated because he kept finding five and six foot depths in the ICW. Now, I'm currently an Oriental. If he's finding five and six foot depths in the ICW, then he's probably not on the channel. His intention was to go offshore at Beaufort, go around Cape Fear, and head straight for Charleston. Now, if he did that, I'm just going to show you what kind of weather he's facing on the ICW here by doing a quick screen share. Let's see if we can do this. Okay, um, bear with me, folks, and we'll see what, uh, what the computer does for us. Okay, the computer and I are fighting. Let me explain to you what the weather is out, on the, out in the Atlantic over the next few days. The weather is going to be going from fairly benign, about 5 to 10, maybe 15 right now. And over the next couple of days and peaking sometime midday Wednesday, the weather is going to be out of the north at about 35 to 40 knots. The sea state is going to be 3 to 5 meters. Now that's 10 to 15 feet of wave action. Now it's coming out of the north the winds are going to be coming out of the northeast, so it's going to make for a fairly uncomfortable ride for a lot of boaters. I don't know about you, but that's not the kind of trip that I plan when I go down the ICW on my way south. And guys, the guys who are listening to this, that's not the trip that your wife's expecting. <laughs> you need to slow down, you need to pay attention to the weather, you need to take a few breaks, it's not a race. That's what you really and honestly need to do if you want to have a pleasant trip and not lose your spouse halfway down somewhere in Charleston. Um, that would be probably my very strongest tip. Now, if you're wondering about weather, you can, of course, watch NOAA.gov, pick it up online. You can go to PassageWeather.com, which gives you excellent wind and weather forecasts. There's a variety of other sources. Those are the two that I would recommend. But again, take your time. If it gets a little cold, buy yourself a Mr. Buddy or if you don't have a heater on board. They're only about 75 or 80 bucks. They'll keep you warm, more than warm enough in your boat. But you don't want to ruin your trip by rushing now and stressing everybody out. That would be my biggest single tip. Um, Mark, what would you want to add to that and what sort of suggestions do you have for making the trip south more easily and more comfortably? Well, I'd, I'd just underscore that and, and even if you get the good weather, um, it, it's funny that the, the, the bump out discussion is always one that's, you know, 
had on every dinghy dock and, and in every cruiser's tiki bar. Uh, but going outside of some of the frying pan shoals goes out 20 miles or something like that. So going out and coming back in Cape Fear for all the, the work that you're doing, unless you're really just going to go offshore and, and go all the way down to the islands, doesn't seem to make a lot of sense for one. But the other thing is, you know, it, it's 1,100 miles of extraordinarily beautiful country. Um, to go through. There's nothing like cruising um, this jewel of the ICW. So in the beginning, I remember my first trips. It was the same thing as how fast could I get to Florida, wait for weather, and bump over to the Bahamas. And you know, over the years, I've learned to slow down. Not just because I'm going to break gear, or I'm going to break people's spirits, but because it's a, it's just a wonderful journey. It really is. Mark, are you still with us there? Yep. Oh, yep. Um, got a bit of screen lag there. Claiborne, what would you like to add to that? Well, gosh, you know, have you got an hour? Um, <laughs> everybody hears all of these, uh, for lack of a better term, horror stories about the Intracoastal Waterway. And it is quite true that the Atlantic Intracoastal Waterway is not as well maintained as it was, oh, let's say 15 years ago. It's all a budgetary situation and it's an ongoing political battle. But those of you who you know, think that they can't do the waterway at all, I'm here to tell you, you're wrong. Yes, there are places, in fact, we're going to look at them here in a minute, where you have to play the tide where when you go through Little Mud River in Georgia, or by Marker 19 in Jekyll Creek, or by the southwestern tip of the Ashipu Kuthal Cutoff north of Beaufort, you want to be going through there at mid to high tide. But if you can read a tide table, you can cruise the Atlantic Intracoastal Waterway. Compared to 20-foot waves offshore like Wally was talking about, no thank you. I would rather enjoy the beauty of the Waccamaw River, an anchorage, uh, say, off the South Edisto River, or cruising up the St. John's River in northeastern Florida. That's my idea of what cruising is all about. So I would really like to urge everybody not to be overly scared of the Atlantic Intracoastal Waterway, but to just take your time, play the tides, and when Wally says so, we're going to take a look at some of the areas you really want to be sure that you do that. Thanks, Claiborne. Um, for those of you who have just joined in recently, there's a, there should be, you should see on the side of your screen a, um, a section where you can address questions on your own specific concerns about the, uh, about the ICW and your cruise. So feel free to get those questions up there and we'll attempt to answer them all between now and the end of the webinar if we can't then we'll certainly make sure that they're answered on the event page. Also, if you need to send, um, rather, if you need to, um, if you'd rather text, you can text to 410-849-9694. So again, you can text your questions to 410-849-9694. Uh, Mark, let's, um, let's go over to you and have you discuss some of the, uh, some of the hazards and such that you face on the ICW, that people face in the ICW as they're traveling south, maybe some of the problem areas. Well, I think, I think Claiborne is probably the best person to go through the, the problem areas. We track 18 of them in the book, and, and I post up depth annotated tracks, um, but share those with Claiborne, and I think that's really the central site to go to um, these days to find out what's... Uh, What's what's going on in each of those areas? So, Cl Claiborne, I think you've got some. As a matter yeah, of fact, yeah, we're, that we're, you want to show folks. We're going to try to do a screen share here. So let let just give me one second, and let's see if this works. Um, hmm. You're up. Yeah, I'm now lost myself though. Um, all right, hang on a minute, everybody. Okay. Okay. Now, what you everyone should be seeing here is the northernmost of the AIC, what I call the AICW problem stretches, the northern mouth of the Alligator River. Is, is that what everyone's seeing? Not me. How about you, Walt? 
Yeah. You've got it. You've clicked on the wrong picture there, I think. All right. Yeah, when you do screen share, it'll give you four or five <laughs> choices. And it looks like you want to go to your website choice. Mm-hmm. Bear with us, everybody. We're, uh, we're noobs at this, but <laughs> if it's like anything else, we'll get better. We won't get worse. We can certainly hope for that. Well, dare to dream. I'm kind of the eternal optimist with technology. Now we got you back. Okay, okay. Now I am going to click on click on this. Okay. Does anybody see the northern mouth of the Alligator River now? Well, it's got a little bit of a lag. So there you go. All right. Okay. Now hopefully you're seeing a chart look here which shows you how the waterway comes through the northern mouth of the Alligator River in northeastern North Carolina. If anybody can see this, you can see there is a significant dog leg in the channel here, south of marker number three. That did not used to be there. This used to be a straight shot. This is not a place where you have to play the tide. This is a place where you want to pay attention to the markers and not your charts and not your chart plotter. I hear all the time on, on our website, the Salty Southeast Cruisers Net, cruisers running aground all the time, and they said, I was just following my chart plotter. You can't do that here. <laughs> you have to follow the marker. Okay? Now, what we're going to attempt to do now, if everybody will hang in there with me, we're going to go, hopefully, to the next area of concern. Now, does everybody see a new chartlet here that says Brown's Inlet? Yes, we do. Okay, excellent. This is south of Swansboro, North Carolina, near Statute Mile 237. And just northeast of Marker 61, in fact, all around Marker 61, really, where the waterway runs behind shallow Browns Inlet. There is significant shoaling here. They have just set reset the markers. Uh, hopefully this is going to be dredged by the end of the year, but you want to be very careful going through this area and you want to observe any temporary markers that you may see. Okay, hang on here. We're going to go along. Um, Okay, now I'm going to hang in here a minute. I understand there's a bit of a lag. We are now near Statute Mile 320, south of the charming community of Southport, North Carolina. And you can see here on this chartlet where the waterway passes behind Lockwood Folly Inlet. Uh, this is an area you want to hit at mid to high tide. The good news is that they're going to be dredging later, late this year, not in time for the fall transit season, but they're going to be dredging. So that thank you, Mac, Mike McIntyre, who's the U.S. House Rep from the Wilmington, North Carolina district. Well, I, while you've got that one up, Claiborne, can I just break in here for a second please. to tell right. people, because we just went through uh, all of those in the last uh, month or so, and, and, and the good news is, well, Cla Claiborne's coming up on one now, Shalot, which is just a horror show, is his action so He can't do anything about it. But some of these other ones are, like Lockwoods, are not in that bad condition. It, again, if you take Claiborne's advice of half tide and rise, it is a good time to go through. But where we usually see people getting in trouble in those areas is because they'll, they're failing to look behind them at the aid that they just went by and through these areas there's often lots of red aids you, you look at the nav aid behind you southbound and the one forward of you and create a range and you don't want to go past it there, there's an awful lot of side sweeping um, currents um, at, at these inlets in North Carolina and and a lot of people are getting in trouble by basically being swept if, if you will you know past that red range and then running aground and, and so it's more of a, the inlet's not that bad if you hit it at the right time, but, you know, you've got a responsibility also, which is to dry, drive the boat 
and stay in the channel, not be side swept out of it. So we've uh, we've actually helped a few boats uh, southbound that that found themselves in that situation. Yeah, Mark. Uh, Mark, is, Mark would, you, would you repeat that technique again for those who might not have caught it or might not be familiar with it, just so they understand what you meant by it, please? Yeah, you have to, uh, certainly, Wally, what you have to do is you have to picture an imaginary line between these. It, 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 often, they'll, the Army Corps has decided that they're going to lead you through a bad area, either f following the reds, if you will, or you're going to be led by the greens. And the inlets are often, uh, and the drop marks and the things that Claiborne mentioned are going to be um, red. So you're following red right returning southbound. You're going to you need to picture an imaginary line between these aids that they place fairly closely going through the inlets, and you want to be constantly looking rearward also over your shoulder and make sure that you're not crossing that imaginary line between your back range red and your forward range red. If you do, you're being swept, of course, out of the channel. You think you're in the channel because you're looking forward, and the red aid may still appear to starboard off your bow, but it doesn't mean that you're actually, um, you know, in the channel. And that's why we see a lot of people saying, "Well, I was in the channel, but I ran hard aground." In in fact, you're not. If you look back behind you, you'll see how you had bananaed out of the channel and off into very shoal water. Yeah, I always describe it as you need to watch your course over your stern as well as your track ahead to see if you're being kept swept sideways because even if it looks like you're heading where you should be heading towards the next marker, you can be being swept sideways, as Mark said. There's a place on the west coast of Florida, which we're, it's not our subject tonight, called the Miserable Mile, where the yeah. waterway runs at right angles to the current. And people, you know, CETO makes their living <laughs> off the miserable mile. Uh, okay, so let, let me quickly run through the rest of these. So what you're seeing, at least I hope what you're seeing now on your screen, is where in extreme southern North Carolina, where the waterway runs behind Shalote Inlet. This has gotten very shoaly here. And again, the good news is this is going to be dredged late this year, but not in time for the fall transient season. Okay, we're now going to wander down into South Carolina, and we're going to be, at least I hope we're going to be just north of Charleston, South Carolina. And here you see on this chartlet where the waterway is running behind Sullivan Island and Isle of Palms, just north of Charleston Harbor. The waterway has gotten very shoaly along here, but the good news is there is a six to eight foot tidal range on, along here. So you can see if you take this at mid to high tide, unless you have a six and a half foot draft, you're going to probably have plenty of depth. Okay, let me let me finish my quick little travel log here. We are now between we are now between Charleston and Beaufort, South Carolina, and fellow cruisers, that's Beaufort, North Carolina, and Beaufort, South Carolina, and woe be unto you if you're in Beaufort and you pronounce it Beaufort. You will not make the locals very happy. But north of Beaufort you can see this man-made section of the waterway here called the Ashifu Kuzal Cutoff. And there are problems at both ends. On the northern end, mm -hmm. marker 177, you have to stay away from the marker because it's shoaled out to the marker. And on the southwestern end at markers 185 and 184, you have to favor marker 184 or you're going to get in shallow water, particularly at low tide. Let's quickly wander on down to Georgia. Uh, give me one second here, ladies and gentlemen. Actually, one more place, excuse me. Let's wander to, and that is Fields Cut. We're in extreme southern South Carolina here. And on this chart where you see the waterway going from Wright River into Fields Cut, that gets very, very shallow right there. You want to take that at mid to high tide. I know it sounds like a broken record, but that, that is the mantra that you need to remember. Uh, now we're in Georgia. We're in a place called Hell Gate, which if you can if you see the chart here, it's a man-made passage between the Vernon River and Ogeechee River. 
This was dredged about two years ago, but it's starting to show again. So again, the best thing to do is to go through that mid to high tide. Now the next area that we're going to look at is, ladies and gentlemen, fellow cruisers, the worst of the worst. This is the worst single worst section of the Atlantic Intracoastal Waterway, Little Mud River, north of Brunswick, Georgia. At low tide, at dead low tide, you would be lucky to get a canoe through the southern part of Little Mud River. But there is a huge tidal range. Go through here at high tide and you will probably be in 8 to 10 feet of water. The last of our rogues gallery, if you will, is also in Georgia. It is a place called Jekyll Creek. And right here on the northern end of this chartlet, you will see marker number 19 right there, flashing green, 19. At anywhere near low tide, if you get close to number 19, you will hear that sad sound of your keel meeting up with the bottom. You do not want to pass too far off 19. Without going into specifics, you want to get on our website and read the specific information which some local captains have provided to us about how to get past number 19. Now there are other problem areas, fellow cruisers, but those are the worst. So at this point, I'm going to stop yakking at you and throw it back to Wally for a little bit. Thank you, Claiborne. Um, you know what I wouldn't mind asking you to reiterate? <clears throat> and it's as much for me as for anybody else watching this, because I'm still north of that point, but could you go back and just review that little section just north of Charleston? I have hit bottom there on one occasion, and I've come real close on two or three more. Okay. And I, I wouldn't mind seeing exactly which markers I'm looking for. I think it's 19 and 17. All right, hang, on, hang, hang on one second, and I will go back to that for you. Uh, there it is. Okay, here we are. Now, now, first, let, in fact, before I go down the chartlet, if you will look near your top of the screen, and this is a typical example of our AICW problem stretch section on the Salty Southeast Cruisers net. You can see we describe the problem, we describe the solution, and then we you, you have a link there where you can click and see what your fellow cruisers are saying about going through these waters. And on the bottom part of this, we have a chartlet. Um, and, and this is the area that Wally is talking about. In fact, the United States Army Corps of Engineers literally just a few weeks ago sent us their latest survey through this area. And you can actually see the waterway runs more east to west here than north and south. And, and here in the area behind Hamlin Creek on the southern side of the waterway, there is exactly point two feet of water at low tide. Now I'm going to try to do something here. I don't know whether this will work or not, but everybody hang with me. I am going to click on this chart to actually open what we call a chart view page. Does, does everybody or does anybody see that a, a bigger chart now? Yes, That's, sir. Okay. Now this is this is what we call chart view. This is powered by uh, some a company called Earth Nautical Charter, Earth in Sea. And you can actually take, if you can see what I'm doing, you can take your, your pointer and you can, can pan these charts as north or south as you want. You can click the plus mark here and you can, you can, you can zoom in. You can see where the Earth in Sea is joined two charts together. And Wally, this is the area that you were talking about, right here. As I'm um, kind of scrolling down here, where the waterway runs behind Isle of Palms, behind Breach Inlet, and then behind Sullivan's Island. And I'm just going to scroll on down here until you act. This is where you actually enter Charleston, South Carolina Harbor, right here. And this area, you simply do, do even Mark, even you guys with your draft, probably don't want to go through here at low tide, kind of thing. So does that answer your question, Wally? Um, actually, yes. Thank you. It does. <coughs> it does, and I appreciate that because I'll be there in a in a short while. Um, and that's the sort of information that I know that people can always find on the Salty Southeast Cruisers Network. Mark, what I wouldn't mind doing is um, 
your Anchorage book, which I've been using since I got a copy last um, last spring, I found really, really useful. And I wouldn't mind you explaining how you make Anchorages easier for people to enter. I think that's that would be important for a lot of people. I lost you at the end there a little bit with the, the, with the audio, Wally. You had said something about our anchor guides, and then I'm sorry, it dropped out. Yeah, um, your anchor guide um, that I've had since last spring has been very useful for, for, to me in finding new places to anchor, uh, even with my familiarity with the ICW. Um, what I wouldn't mind doing is having you explain to people what you've done that makes your anchoring guide just a little bit different and special. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, it was interesting. Diane and I, I, I've told this story before to some people, but Diane and I were in uh, a really nice anchorage that we, we like, we favor, Tagudu Creek. And uh, Diana had the scope out on the foredeck, and she was looking at birds, and I was on the back uh, cooking a bird. I had the grill going, and I was making chicken, <laughs> and it was just... It's Taguda Creek. I know we've all been there. I mean, so I don't have to explain it. It's a beautiful anchorage. It was a beautiful night. Everything was going really well. And then all of a sudden, I say to Diana, I said, uh, "Why? Why are we here?" And she she gave me the look that wives give husbands, like, "Well, sort of, what's bothering you, muffin?" And uh, and I said, "We always go here because she had said, "Why are we here? You like this place? I like this place. We we always stop here." And I said, "That's the problem." I said, we've turned into commuters. Um, we're, we're going to a lot of the same places over and over again. And I, and I said, why do we do that? And we started talking about it. And we decided that it was that first, um, you, you know, that first, the stress of first entry into an anchorage stops people. So if you've gone somewhere, and it doesn't have to be a bad anchorage, but you've gone to, as a matter of fact, if it's a lovely anchorage, then you now start timing your stops and you continue to go there. And you've got these, uh, you know, five to ten anchorages that you always go to and five to ten marinas and, and everything. And so we said, what can we do to make that um, different for people so that they, they can go in the first time um, with confidence? And it's obviously good for the first timers because they'll <laughs> they'll take anything. And <laughs> if you if you do a good job, they'll go there. But... What we wanted to do, as a matter of fact, is attract veterans like you, and and we used you and, and the SSCA and a lot of the, the cruisers as a model, and let me see if I can do a screen share and pull up um, something. And uh, some people have there, you there you go. Are you seeing that? I am. Okay, beautiful. What we did was we, we hooked up our digital depth sounders with some proprietary software. We hooked up our digital depth sounders on each bow and feed them to the computers. And when we go into an anchorage, as you can see here, what we do is according to a particular height of tide at the relevant tide station, this would be Hampton River and I'm just showing this, we actually drop a, a depth every 120 feet. I can either set for time or I can set for distance and I've just decided over time that 120 feet is the granularity that works. So anyone now can can read our summary and see if you can take your dogs ashore, get groceries and and when they go in their their Garmin chart plotter or their laptop with e-charting software or whatever will refer to this tide station and you'll see about where you were and say, well, the Doyles went in and it was 2.8 above and rising, so about 3 feet. So it is, as I come in here, and I'm only 1 foot, say, above, then I should be seeing about 2 feet less than the Doyles saw. But in general, anyway, um, I can see what these depths are and subtract 3 feet from them and, and you know what mean low water is. So it's it's been really nice that people will go in and if they're looking for an anchorage that you know ha has five six feet they can anchor across the public piers if they can clear the the fixed bridge and go above it so for the trawlers and and powerboat cruisers they can go to a really lovely anchorage up here just past that fixed bridge but you see the NOAA chart which was something I think was always missing in anchoring guides and get the the objective feedback of what's the height of tide, what is my depths going in, exactly where do I anchor, how do I get in and in and out, and what the depths are as you go. And a side benefit is that on all of these screenshots, these are actually screenshots from our computers, 
th these are where the these nav objects are. So you also see where the marinas are and everything, and very very accurately. Noah often mischarts where boat ramps are as an example, and that's where you're going to go ashore. So they're really pictorial, but also highly, you know, accurate and objective representations of anchorages. So if people use them once or twice, um, you know, that and and they see. That they're uh, that they're accurate. Then now they start going to places they haven't gone before. They have the confidence to do that. So people are getting back to to cruising and trying new anchorages a little bit more instead of um, you know just going to the same old anchorages. So that that was our hope anyway. And I, I I'm hearing it's working, so that's good. It, it's working for me because I've I've used your book and found a number of anchorages that I hadn't been in before. And what it's been allowing me to do, and this has been really pleasant, sometimes I'll do long, long days to get to an anchorage that I know is good. And what I've been able to do, especially this time of year in the fall, is to be able to shorten my runs into you know, a more reasonable length day and, and come into an anchorage that I'd not tried before because I was a little bit unsure of it. One well, of the top we also oh. dropped a lot of them, which was good. We, we, we surveyed... We've been keeping track of about 320 to 340 anchorages, and we surveyed about 320 of those, and many of them have become untenable over the years, so we call them legacy anchorages, and if you're pushing on, if you haven't done this in a while, so you push on to make it to um, Dutchman Creek, or push on to make it to Wally's Leg, or push on to make to, to some of these anchorages that you've used in the past, they're not good anchorages anymore. Or, or we also found we dropped to about 280 anchorages, so we proudly have the fewest anchorages now <laughs> instead of the most anchorages. Um, if there's five anchorages in three miles, we've come to realize that mo at most cruisers, that if, if three or four of them have the exact same wind protection, but two of them don't have any shore access, um, or one of them um, gets a lot of jet ski activity, um, then, then you should drop those and have fewer anchorages, but better anchorages, and make sure that all of them are tenable. So, you know, we've, you can see, you can't have depth tracks and geotag photos if you haven't been in them. We've, in the last three years, we've been in every one of those anchorages at least four times. It was a, it was an interesting project. <laughs> I, I, I know it's certainly been helpful to me, as I was saying. One of the things I wanted to address. There's a lot of information out there. And I think sometimes the sheer volume of information available to new cruises is very confusing. Now, Claiborne, I know that with the information that you receive from cruisers, you vet that information. You take a look at it. You make sure that it's correct. And I know you check with sources such as the uh, the Corps of Engineers on on occasion too, don't you? Yes, yes, we do. I mean, we we use a lot of sources. Uh, we use the Corps of Engineers. Uh, we actually use the Coast Guard. They call us up from time to time and ask me where the shallow water is. You know, I'm in, in touch with the CETO uh, franchise owners, with the Tobo U.S. people, you know, they're, you, you draw together a lot of information. What we try to do is we try to amalgamate together, you know, the information that comes in from the cruising community with professional research and you know we, we try to to see we don't post anything on our site unless we have a reasonable assurance that it is accurate information now we can't guarantee 100 and do not guarantee 100 percent accuracy but you know having done the waterway you know as much as we have uh, I and my editors have some idea of whether something looks right or does not look right so yeah, we try to do that. And there is a lot of information. Um, people ask me, should we use paper cruising guides, or should we use online sources, or should we use electronic charts, or should we use paper charts, or should we use the Cruiser's Net, or should we use Waterway Guide or the Doyle's Book? My answer to all those questions is yes. <laughs> In other words, use them all. There has never been any such creature as having too much information when you're on the water. But you do need to choose sites and books where the information is well organized so you can get to what you need. That's some of my best advice for traveling the waterway. One more piece of advice, and I'll throw it back to you guys, particularly for you AICW newbies. Another question I get asked a lot is, should we stay in marinas or should we anchor off? 
If you're new to the waterway, may I humbly suggest that you try some of both. You will quickly learn what fits your particular cruising tastes. Some, it may be a combination of the two. You may decide that you want to stay in marinas every night. You could be like Mark and Diana and, and decide you want to anchor out most every night. But it's just what fits you and your taste. And by the way, that's one reason on our website we don't ask people to rate marinas. Because the marina Wally likes, I may just think is too small or too large or too crowded or too remote. Better you just give us your impressions and then other people can draw their own conclusions. Okay, I, I have been accused of never using four words when I could use eight. But I'll throw it back to you guys now. <laughs> hey, but I'm not going to touch that one. <laughs> it brought up something though, that I wanted to address, and that's the elephant in the room, and, and it's called crowdsourcing. Now, a lot of, like, I know that you use a certain amount of crowdsourcing, and then you vet the information. As an editor, a cruising editor for Waterway Guide, I can tell you that when we get tips from people, my, our managing editor sends it on to us to confirm it, because we're the people who are on the water and know what's going on. However, however, there are sources of information out there where it's nothing but information from other boaters. Now the problem is you don't know the validity, the quality of that information. I can speak for areas that I've been in where I've seen somebody recommend an anchorage that has a Volkswagen sized rock right in the middle of the channel. And the same guy who said it was a wonderful anchorage in another post that would happen to be substantially harder to find explained that he brought his 39 foot sea ray out with his engines raised because he was afraid that he was going to take out his outdrive. So the sources of information you use, and that's why I invited you two on here, because amongst all the sources available on the, on the internet, or on, on paper, or anywhere at all, you two guys are running two of the best sources, and along with what you guys are doing, along with Waterway Guide, you've got all the information you could conceivably need to actually make a safe and comfortable ICW transit, and I think that's incredibly important. You have to consider the source of your information. And, and too often, people are selecting sources that are not vetted, that are not qualified, and that, quite frankly, in my opinion, are just strictly unsafe. Mark, did you want to add to that? Well, I think it's a, you know, I think it's important to have some sort of vetting process. It's it's interesting. We um, s side story. I bought Diana a rice cooker, um, and what what do I know about rice, and particularly what do I know about rice cookers? Um, so I went onto a crowdsource site and I found a place that had 1,200 people had reviewed a particular rice cooker. They had used other rice cookers. They didn't like them. They sold them or gave them away. They bought this particular rice cooker, and I don't know. There was like 1,200 people, and 1,197 of them were really happy. Um, so I bought that rice cooker, and Diana really likes it. So I mean, I think crowdsourcing, you know, it works. Um, it it just depends on what you're trying to. Um, to get out of it, um, we use Active Captain um, to see if there's lots of green stars. If people like a particular place, and then we try and figure out why. And if we agree um, or whatever, it's probably you know one of the larger you know most popular crowdsourcing sites that's out there. We'll use it to see um, not fuel because it's not updated as frequently. Claiborne's it, it's interesting. It's horses for courses. Claiborne's got the best site, I think, for fuel because he's got K. <laughs> so he's you know, and K's like a terrier with a slipper. You know, she calls all these places every week, and you go on there, and fuel pricing uh, is always spot on. I've never not got the right um, price and gone to a dock um, from Claiborne's um, a, a site, and, and and fuel's becoming more important in our life. So, um, you know, these these aren't. Even the electronic sites have got some sort of vetting and some, you know, professionals um, working for them. But if we're trying to figure out um, where some hazards are, where uh, other things are happening, um, a lot of times we'll pick that up on Active Captain. We'll pick it up on Waterway Guide. We'll pick it up on Salty Southeast Cruisers Net. So I think what you said is important is to realize the source, find out what they're good at. Um, and then use that stuff. And the same thing with paper. Awful lot of paper guides out there. It's kind of confusing. So you have to figure out what works for you with the um, with the paper guides.
I think you're muted, Wally. Yeah, Wally is muted. Okay. Hello, hello. There we go. You're okay. unmuted. <laughs> okay. Um, we've got a couple of questions in here. Um, okay. One of them: What is a good mount to hold an iPad in a life-proof case for use in the cockpit? Um, I, that's you know what? that's I a Mark no question. Idea. That's a Mark question. <laughs> yeah, we've got a bunch. Yeah, we got a bunch of cases. We got about a bunch of mounts. Um, you know, I think Ram mount is winning that particular fight, if you will. So take a look at what they've got, and they've got all kinds of little, you know, stanchion adapters or you know, base adapters and little Lexi arms and swivels and and doodads. None of these. Uh, these are marine devices with a capital M. So you're going to pay for them, but they do a really good job and. And I think also the, the the quality of the RAM mounts is good, especially if it's in a for an external application. Ah, okay, great. So I'm just I'm reviewing questions while you're talking. You caught me. Um, we have greetings from Cheryl and Paul Shard, out, who are actually in uh, Orillia, Ontario, which is where I used to live. Wow. Those of you Paul and Cheryl Shard, uh, they do the Distant Shores television series, and um, I believe their boat is currently down in the Caribbean. I can't recall where. But Paul and Cheryl, thanks for joining us very much. Now, ladies and gentlemen who are watching, if you have specific questions about the ICW, now's the time to uh, get them online so that we can start answering them. You can text them. We'll take Mark out of there and we'll get me back up. There we go. You can text them to the number on the screen, 410-849-9496. Or alternatively, <coughs> excuse me, alternatively you can... Uh, select. Uh, you can ask questions on the uh, the screen on the right, which you should be able to see there without too much difficulty. Um, so, if you have questions, forward them in. Uh, we haven't done a lot of talking about marinas at this point. And Claiborne, how about you? Uh, you have a couple of favorite marinas on the way south, and I know a number of them concur with what Mark likes. So maybe you could mention those uh, some of your favorite marinas on the way south that people might want to check out. Places with you know easy access. Um, Decent fuel prices, that sort of thing. Uh, gee, Wally, how long have you got? <laughs> you know? Well, I mean, we have about 16 minutes, so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's no way that I can cover, you know, my favorite marinas. So instead, let me just mention a few ports of call that I really don't think that people should miss, uh, and and these are in no particular order of importance. But uh, let me just start down in South Carolina and mention Georgetown, South Carolina, which is about 30 miles south of Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, just south of where the waterway runs through the Waccamaw River. Now, a lot of people have heard that Georgetown had a fire here in their downtown section recently. Uh, the fire, it, it was devastating. It destroyed uh, two-thirds of a block. But Georgetown is still open. It is still an, a, one, an incredibly charming, historic community with some of the best dining that you will ever have in your life. Those of you who are taking notes, write down the rice paddy and the river room, not to be missed, restaurants in Georgetown. A bit farther to the south, you have not quite lived if you've not mentioned, uh, visited Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, the, the past is a tangible entity in Charleston. It, it's like no, not even Savannah or Williamsburg, Virginia. It's like Charleston. It's really an amazing place. It is also replete with superb marinas and excellent restaurants. Uh, moving further to south, yes, you should visit Savannah. Uh, you can go up river and dock at the Hyatt Savannah docks on the Savannah waterfront. Or alternately, you can tie up right on the waterway in Thunderbolt and take an inexpensive taxi or bus into the Savannah Historic District with its dreamlike green squares and parks. It is a wonderful, wonderful place. A bit farther to the south, getting in Florida, I would highly recommend people stop at Fernandina Beach, a charming port of call with kind of a turn of the century theme. You just want to be sure to stay on the outside pier of the city dock there. I mean, I could go on, Wally, for hours, but that is just a few places that I want to mention. Before I turn it over, though, let me try to do one more screen share here because Mark brought up Mark brought up fuel prices, and I did want to show everybody one little trick. Um, does anybody see... 
Uh, what? Yeah. Does it, are we? Are, does anybody see back to the AICW problem? The AICW north of the Ben Sawyer Bridge. Is that what you're seeing, guys? Uh, no. no yeah, I think you hit the you hit the wrong uh, screen image again. So it's picking uh, okay. up the plus thing. Claiborne, while you're hunting for it, I'm just going to mention uh, you go right ahead. that we have Ben Allison here from uh, the Marine Electronics website, Panbo. Uh, ben, thanks for your comment here. He mar remarked for the earlier questioner that the life-proof the life proof flat mount clip will take a RAM mount ball. So that's the answer to that question. Um, we have another question here that we'll get into in a second, and then we'll get back to Claiborne here. Um, somebody just noted, Kay Dolliver Harrison noted that she just finished a four and a half week trip from Annapolis to St. Augustine using all of these recommended sources, paper and electronics. It was a great trip, but she was surprised several times by the inaccuracy of wind forecasts. They'd say five to ten knots, and we get battered by twenty to twenty-five. Mark, you want to take that one on? That's <laughs> well. Everybody always kids, of course. That if you were to be a meteorologist, you could be wrong uh, sixty to eighty percent of the time and still draw a paycheck. So, um, <laughs> the, the, the the in in everyone's um, in their defense, all the uh, the, the 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 weather guessers. Uh, defense, <laughs> It good, is a good lot. Good term, Mark. Good term. Well, well, it's funny because it, 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 a lot of it's the source, though, too. And, and the problem is, is someone's standing somewhere on the end of a dock, and they point their nose seaward, and they want to know what's going to happen um, in their immediate area. And the granularity of that is usually not, you know, especially more and more of the coastal cruisers are listening to coastal information. And those broadcast sources are, are doing over a region, and they'll tell you that this is what's going to happen over the region. So it's not necessarily going to happen um, to what you're looking at. Um, we find that actually a lot of the, the some of the best resources are for, for windsurfers um, and, and, and things like that. You know, it's because they're very interested not in offshore um, forecasts or or what what Noah calls near coastals, but they're they're interested in really what's happening right along the beach. And because a lot of the ICW is just behind that beach, um, you know the 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 the, ki the kite sailors and the windsurfers and stuff, um, their their resources are a little bit better. So you know it's it, I don't know what to say. We're still using weather underground a lot, and it's not as as bad as the others. And and some of these consumer sources versus the the actual marine sources, because like I say, I think the marine sources are based on being out there a little bit further than most of us are. I'm going to go over and switch to when Claiborne's done, as a matter of fact, I'm going to, I, I've got some things to say probably about some uh, marinas and, and things like that too, Molly. So, Claiborne, up. Go for it, okay. um, we have another question come in, uh, thought from the to Charleston this Friday. I'm not certain if the, uh, that's from uh, Anthony Baker, by the way. Hello, Anthony. I'm not sure whether you're referring to weather or not, uh, the key to when you bait at Charleston is when you leave Georgetown, and I'm going to assume you're in Georgetown, try and leave about a half an hour to an hour after the tide starts to ebb at the, at the entrance of the Georgetown uh, Harbor. The reason you want to do this is that it will give you a fair tide all the way out Winyah Bay once you re-enter the ICW, and in fact, most of the way to, uh, to Charleston. Um, interestingly enough, you asked that question. I have a video on my website. Um, it's bloggingtheicw.blogspot.com, and if you go on there and use the search function and type in Georgetown, you'll come up with a video showing that route, showing how you can do it, and actually showing you exactly what it looks like. And I think that you might find that very enjoyable. Um, I'll post that answer um, on the event page a little bit later on for you. Uh, Claiborne, let's get back to you there. Okay, well first I'd like to say something about Winyah Bay, Charleston because you, you, you're you going to be going through two of those AICW problem stretches there. Uh, the one, there's one near the charming community of McClellanville, South Carolina, where at low tide the waterway can be quite shallow. And then the one we looked at here just a while ago, and Wally, the one you asked the question about, the waterway just north of Charleston Harbor where the waterway runs behind Isle of Palms and Sullivan's Island. You definitely want to take those areas at mid to high tide. Okay, can everybody or Wally, can you fix it so people can see my website at this point? Uh, they can. You're on okay. now. Okay, now 
just a quick, those of you who are concerned about fuel prices, I just want to show you a little trick. Now, suppose you're in South Carolina and you need to fill some hungry diesel fuel tanks and you want to know where you can get the best price. So notice these red vertically stacked menus. You click on South Carolina and you go down there and you will see this selection that says South Carolina fuel prices. If you click on that, you and it says Osprey Marina. <laughs> you will see all the places for which we report fuel prices in South Carolina originally in geographic order. But now up here at the top of the page, and here's the trick I want to show you. Notice this button just to the right of the title that says sort fuel prices, find the best deal. If you hover your mouse over that, you get a drop down menu. The first selection is geographic order, but I want to call your attention to the second and third selection. Diesel prices low to high, gas prices low to high. Click on diesel prices, and the, what happens is the page rearranges itself from those, uh, and as you're right, Mark, there's Osprey right on top. It arranges <laughs> itself to those that have the least expensive diesel fuel prices at the top, descending down the page to those that have more and more expensive diesel fuel prices. So just a quick tip there on how you can find the best fuel price deal. Okay, back to you guys. It, it strikes me that uh, you update your, um, your, your fuel prices on a weekly basis, and that probably makes you one of the best sources for that for those who want to save a buck or two. Well, thank you, Wally. Your, your check's in the mail. But, yeah, we do have a, we do have a long-suffering fuel price editor that Mark has already referred to, Kay Adams, who every Wednesday, and I don't know how she does this, gets on the telephone and, uh, and call all, calls all the marinas and fuel retailers for which we report fuel prices. We don't report everyone, but we report most of them, all the way from the North Carolina-Virginia line, actually north of there, up in Norfolk, all the way around to the west coast of Florida. It's quite a marathon Wednesday for her. You, you, you ought to set up a tip jar for Kay. I think she's, uh, she, she's, she's a one heck of a resource, let me tell you. Uh, we just got a uh, comment in from Dave Skolnick. For those who don't know Dave, he's the president of the Seven Seas Cruising Association. Now, for those of you cruisers who are not a member of this group, I can tell you from, from even from yesterday, there was an SSCA member who came cruising into Oriental with an engine problem, couldn't get the engine to stop to, to start for them. They got on their, their cell phone and they started texting and they text into the SSCA Facebook page and within minutes they had answers from probably eight or ten people including suggestions on what might the problem be, suggestions on how to fix it, and suggestions on who could help them out in the town of Orientals from people who live there. So that kind of assistance when you're on the water is just incredible and an organization like the SSCA can provide it for you. Again, that Seven Seas Cruising Association now the comment from Dave Skolnick, and again I'll have to uh, put this in the events page so the answer is there. He commented that at the top of the ICW there's a really good Chesapeake wind vector model at HTTP uh, colon double slash tides and never mind I'll put it in the event page nobody's going to remember it if I just say it. I thought that was rather important. Um, okay, we're um, running into the last few minutes of our webinar here. Uh, if anybody has any more questions, you're going to have to get them in here real quick so we can handle them. Um, I think that, uh, failing that, uh, maybe a last, Mark, we lost you there? Nope, there you are. No, uh, I, I popped, yeah, I popped up this thing that you had asked earlier about, yeah, uh, and I, I don't have the page, it's the only thing that I could find on this computer to, to quick throw up, but on the inside um, front cover, um, are, are, are the trouble spots and where they are that, that Claiborne's talked about in descriptions, but more importantly is that, you know, Diane and I are fast becoming known as the cheap skates that, that we are. We're, we're okay with this. And uh, one, of the, one of the most popular presentations we give is, is called 50 Frugal Favorites, and we're, we're really up to about 56 of these now. But it, it, these are the non-anchorages, so there's some favorite anchorages also, but there's lots of good anchorages. But um, these are the non-anchorages that are free docks and walls, mooring fields, and buck-a-foot-or-less marinas along the Hampton to the Biscayne routes. 
So it's that classic thing if there's a marina that's a dollar a foot or whatever and gives you muffins in the morning versus the place that's next door that's two or three bucks um, a, a foot and all, all they give you is attitude. Um, we sort of singled those out and uh, listed those. And uh, what I'll do, Wally, is I'll give you a PDF of this uh, last page here. I'll give you a PDF so you can post that up or I'll put it in a public Dropbox and we'll post up the link or whatever and then everybody can see um, a lot of the places uh, to go and, and uh, as you said before, save a buck. You're not going to make any... Um you're not going to be making any remarks about cheap Canadian sailors this time around? You oh, no, no eh? I'm the, I'm the cheapest Canadian sailor I know. <laughs> <laughs> and you're not even Canadian. That's right. Okay, folks, we're rolling up to the end of it. We've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, I want to thank the people who asked questions, and especially the marine professionals who, who pitched in there, um, Ben Allison and Dave Skolnick, who are well-known in the industry. Um, Mark and Claiborne, your help has been really, really helpful. I know that uh, we're probably going to get questions that will come in on the event page following this. Um, folks, those of you who are uh, here in the seminar and those who catch up with it later on on the YouTube uh, rebroadcast, feel free to ask your questions. We will attempt to answer them as best we can, provide you with whatever sources or assistance we can, and pretty much direct you in the right, in the right way to go, because what we really want is for your trip to be the safest, most comfortable, and most enjoyable possible. Uh, if you see me on the waterway, I have a red to 434, bright red with a Canadian flag. Boat's name is Gypsy Wind. Mark, you've got a, um, it's a PDQ 32 Power Cat, if I remember right. Yeah, PDQ 34 Power Cat. I'll try and, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, in a second, I'm going to show a picture of that if I can. You go ahead and, and, and keep going. I'm going to find one. And Claiborne, some yeah. last words. I guess everybody knows that I've been off the water for several years due to my wife's illness, but now that my life has changed, everybody's going to see me back out there in a few months. We're looking forward to that, Claiborne. It'll be good to see you on the water again. And yeah. as everybody has stated already, condolences on the past from your wife. Thank you very much. Mark, uh, you were looking for a picture there? Yeah, I'm working on it. <laughs> we, may have, we may have to post that on the event page if you don't find it quickly. Yeah, it's it's a uh, oh sugar. Ladies and oh, gentlemen, we've got time for one more question. If somebody can type us one more question really, really quickly, we'll take it. If not, we'll sign off. You've got about forty seconds to go here. I appreciate everybody joining us tonight. It has been a pleasure. Yeah, we've had a lot of fun too. Di Diana's been hanging out. She's she's sitting. Up Hang on, everybody. No. <laughs> there she is. There's my girl. <laughs> Hello, Diana. Good to see you. Okay. She's, she's my handler. She's she's always within several feet. Just in case, yeah, there. Swap. <laughs> <laughs> we know how Diana. We know how Diana handles you, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us for ICW Tune-Ups and Tricks. If you have further questions, if we didn't get to your question. Um, Make certain, and we aren't going to tell you what the Irish guys said. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, that was one of the questions we had. Anyway, thanks again for joining ICW Tune-Ups and Tricks. This will be the first of several webinars on cruising the ICW. Uh, any questions, any comments, you can leave them on the events page, or again, you can text uh, the phone number that is at the bottom of uh, the screen that you see here. Mark, Claiborne, thank you very much. Uh, I know that you guys will pitch it on the events page when there are questions that come up that I can't handle. So I look forward to that. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for joining us. Very much appreciated. Uh, we hope we'll see you out in the water. We hope your ICW trip will be just as enjoyable as you planned for it to be. Thanks again. Good, good, Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone.